great pleasure to have Professor Ben Rosenau here from the University of Leipzig. Uh, so Professor Rosenau got his PhD in Würzburg, um, and then he did postdocs at MPA Heidelberg, and then Harvard, and then Cologne, and then back to Harvard again, which is where we first crossed paths when I was a graduate student there. Um, so we both left at the same time. I graduated in 2008, and Baron finished his postdoc, and then went on to be a group leader at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. Uh, and then in 2010, he became a full professor in Leipzig. Um, so Professor Rosen is an expert on quantum Hall physics, which we're going to talk about today, and disorder, and quantum phase transitions, um, and all kinds of great stuff. And, and we, uh, we've been working a lot this week, actually, on helium. So has a, a wide range of, of knowledge and expertise. And so today he's going to talk about anions. Um, and Professor Rosen we have a small token of our appreciation for the like speakers. And thank, thank you very much for the thing. Wow, that looks very nice. Yeah, it's a nice memory of my uh, stay here. So thank you very much for the friendly introduction and for hosting me and for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk about uh, some of my work here. So this is actually work done together with others, uh, with um, Bert Halperin, um, uh, Kurt von Kaiserling, who's a he used to be a PhD student of Steve Simon, who is now a postdoc at Princeton. Isa Neda, Steve Simon, and Ali Stern. So, I would like to start by discussing um, aspects of quantum statistics. So, the quantum statistics we usually know are fermionic and bosonic. And quantum statistics is about the behavior of the many particle wave functions when interchanging coordinates of particles. So, interchanging uh, coordinates of particle i and j. And then uh, this can result either in a plus sign, which means nothing changes, or it can result in a minus sign. And uh, that is the difference between uh, fermions and bosons. And so this minus sign is in fact very important because um, the quantum mechanical ground states of fermions is a resistive metal, a dissipative metal, whereas the ground state of bosons is a superfluid. And all this is due uh, to this difference in uh, statistics and the behavior of the wave function when interchanging uh, particle positions. So in three spatial dimensions in which we live, that's the only type of statistics with it, which is possible because um, double interchange, which, move, which means moving one particle in a loop around the other particle, has to be a trivial operation because in three dimensions a loop can be contracted to a point and that means a double exchange has to give back the original state, and that's why a plus and a minus sign are the only possibilities. Uh, in two-dimensional systems, where a loop uh, cannot necessarily be contracted uh, to a point if something is inside the loop, uh, there are richer possibilities uh, for quantum statistics. They can be extended in interesting ways, and uh, one uh, possibility or one example is the quantum Hall effect. I'm going to say more about it. Uh, in a moment. So, um, for the moment, um, I only want to assume that there's an energy gap in the ground state. And um, uh, the ground state uh, is described by a wave function which depends on all the coordinates of electrons. And obviously, the wave function has to be anti-symmetric when exchanging the positions of electrons. But in addition, the wave function depends on parameters which are denoted by capital R's here. And these parameters denote the location of quasiparticles. Um, Laughing quasiparticles, I'm going to explain them in a moment. And the idea is now that one very slowly moves these um, uh, particles described by these extra coordinates such they exchange their position in space and then ask what um, this wave function does. And it happens so that there is the possibility that it is multiplied by a general phase factor, not just a plus sign or a minus sign. And for instance, for the one third laughing state, this phase factor happens to be pi over 3. And this is the type of generalization of quantum statistics, uh, which is called anionic statistics. So anion comes from any. It can be any phase, not just a plus uh, or a minus sign. Uh, so let me step back now and uh, this, uh, say a few words about the quantum Hall effect and how one can model or understand uh, these anionic particles. So before discussing uh, the quantum Hall effect, I would like to say a few words about uh, the Hall effect in two-dimensional systems. So um, the, the, we need 
to restrict the motion of electrons to two spatial dimensions. And the way this is often done is to have a uh, heterostructure of different semiconducting materials. So that would be aluminum gallium arsenide um, and then gallium arsenide. And if one goes through the details of the band structure calculation, one finds that there is a minimum in the potential for electrons um, at this interface, and that's why electrons can only move in the x and y direction, but not in the z direction. And that's what I mean by talking about uh, electrons moving in two dimensions, or two-dimensional electrons. Um, so that's now a top view of such a two-dimensional system. Um, it has four contacts, um, to the left and to the right. These are current contacts, so current, a current I is fed into the system at the left contact extracted from the system at the right contact, and then I have two voltage probes. Uh, so no current flows into or out of the sample here, just uh, the voltage is measured. So the whole resistance is now the difference between voltages at top and bottom, divided by the current. So the direction in which the voltage is measured is sort of perpendicular to the current. And um, in addition to this, um, one can characterize transport locally by introducing a current density and an electric field. And then uh, the uh, connection between them is the resistivity or the Hall resistivity in this case. And um, in two dimensions, something peculiar happens is that um, the Hall resistance connecting currents and voltages has the same units and the same magnitude as the Hall resistivity connecting um, electrical fields and current density. And if one computes uh, this Hall resistivity in a classical theory, just solving the equations of motion for electrons in a magnetic field, one finds that um, it is proportional to the strength of a magnetic field, which would be perpendicular um, to this two-dimensional system. And it is divided by the density of electrons and the electron charge. So that's the classical behavior of the Hall resistivity. Uh, so what happens in the so-called quantum hall regime, which is reached at very high magnetic fields of, of several Teslas. So that's the magnetic field axis. And on the right, that's the hall resistivity axis. So at uh, low magnetic field, we see the classically expected behavior that the hall resistivity is proportional to the magnetic field. At higher magnetic fields, starting at about two Teslas, something surprising happens. So it's not a linear slope anymore, but they are plateaus, and then steps, and uh, then uh, more plateaus. And it happens that uh, this Hall resistivity can now be described not anymore as V divided by uh, electron density, electron charge, but instead by a combination of fundamental constants, Planck's constant, divided by the square of the electron charge, and 1 over an integer. So that's the values. Um, of these plateaus here, and uh, this is the integer quantum ball effect. At the same time, uh, the longitudinal resistivity um, drops to zero um, at the plateau values, and uh, what this indicates is that there is no energy dissipation in the system because uh, the rate of energy dissipation is longitudinal resistivity times the square of the current density. So the system is an insulator in the bulk, uh, there is no energy dissipation and um, has uh, these steps. And I will later explain in more detail that all the current flows along the edges of the sample since it's an insulator in the interior. Um, uh, quite amazingly, uh, the story goes on. So that's what was discovered by uh, von Klitzing. If one has even cleaner samples and even higher magnetic fields, one finds that this 1 over nu can also be a fraction of two integers where um, the integer and the denominator has to be an odd um, number. And so that's even higher magnetic fields going up to 30 Tesla. Uh, that's an, uh, the, the integer, uh, the, the integer plateau for nu equal 1. That's the integer plateau for nu equal 2, for nu equal 3 and 4. But it turns out that for even higher magnetic field, there is a large zoo of um, additional fractions uh, where we have this ratio of integers, and that's um, the fractional quantum mall effect. So the phenomenology of the fractional one is similar to the integer one. There are plateaus in rho xy, and rho xx goes to zero. Uh, and uh, the 
one of all fraction which um, um, has the most interest at the moment is for an even integer uh, where this quantity mu takes the value of 5 half and um, I'm going to explain later that a very special type of ambience uh, is hosted, or believed to be hosted uh, at the state. Um, so how can one think about um, ambience? So I explained that the quantum law regime can be characterized by a resistivity tensor where the longitudinal components are zero and where the hall, the off-diagonal components, are um, h over e squared times the inverse of an integer. Um, for my description of ambience, I need the conductivity instead of the resistivity. And the conductivity is obtained by inverting um, this 2 by 2 matrix, which is very trivial in this case. So, oops, what happened to it? Oops, it's gone. Okay, sorry about that. So if one inverts this matrix, uh, then um, the prefactor is inverted, so it's a mu times e squared over h, and there is a, um, uh, an additional minus sign on the off diagonals. So what I'm going to use is that the Hall conductivity is in uh, is this um, uh, number mu times e squared over h, and um, uh, I want to perform a thought experiment or a Gedanken experiment where I very slowly, adiabatically, um, add some additional flux to the system. So the assumption is um, that I have the capability of concentrating magnetic field in a very thin solenoid and then um, model this as a, a line here. So I have an additional magnetic field going through the system which is concentrated in a very small area such that I can characterize it by the additional flux, which is the product of magnetic field and area. Um, it turns out that there is a fundamental unit of flux, which is the ratio of the Planck constant and the electron charge, and we will see in a moment that it's useful to insert um, exactly this amount um, of flux uh, to the system. So there will be, uh, when changing flux by the law of induction, there will be a voltage and the voltage will be along um, a ring in the plane, so there will be an electric field, and when integrating along the electric field, one finds the voltage, and that's just the time derivative of the flux. Now, uh, the Hall conductivity describes a current which flows perpendicular to the electric field. So if the electric field is circular, the current will flow into the ring, and the amount of current is uh, the Hall conductivity, mu e squared over h, times the voltage. Now I can integrate both sides of the equation with respect to time. So on the right hand side I obtain the total flux uh, which is added and on the left hand side I obtain the total charge. And uh, when inserting here on the right hand side h over e, uh, it cancels against an h over e and I'm left with a charge uh, u times e. So it's a fractional charge, it's a fraction of the electron charge and think, for instance, about mu being one third. So that is uh, the, the most robust uh, fractional quantum Hall state. So I have set up uh, the, the following model uh, for an anion. It's a fractional charge mu times e, say one third of the electron charge, and um, together with it goes a quantum of magnetic flux, or magnetic flux of the amount um, h over e. Now I'm in a position to ask what happens when I take one anion in a loop around another anion. And uh, going in a loop around another particle is just exchanging position twice. So the phase factor which I pick up is e to the i two times this anionic exchange phase um, theta. And I can calculate it now. So the idea is um, to go in a loop, take one particle in a loop around uh, the other particle. And the quantum mechanical phase uh, which is accrued in the process is the integral of the wave vector times um, uh, the path. And using the De Broly relation, um, h bar times the wave vector is the momentum. So the wave vector is 1 over h bar times the momentum. And as you know, the canonical momentum um, has two components. It has a kinematic contribution, mass times velocity. And it has an electromagnetic contribution, um, charge times vector potential. Now, I, 
talked about adiabatically doing these things. Adiabatically means doing them very slowly, such that um, um, uh, no excitations are created. And very slowly means that the velocity of, of, of the particle goes to zero. So this first part, this kinematic part, will not contribute to the phase. It will only be uh, the electromagnetic part. Now, I'm multiplying numerator denominator by 2 pi, so I get a 2 pi over h. And I'm using the fact that the charge of the particle is nu times um, the electron charge. And I have a line integral over the vector potential. And using Stokes' theorem, I can convert this into an area integral over the curl of the vector potential, which is uh, the total flux included. And the flux included in this example is the flux which, which is glued to the anion, which gives, us, which gives rise to the fractional charge of the anion. So that's a phi naught. So I multiply by h over e, so the h cancels, the e cancels, and I obtain the result 2 pi times nu. And um, uh, from this I get that the anionic phase is pi times um, this fractional number nu. So that's a way to understand the occurrence of this fractional phase. So how to detect anions? Uh, in high energy physics, uh, we are used to having huge particle detectors which are as heavy as like 100 airplanes and then they are signatures of the particle. And it's not like that you would see the new particle with your, a with your eyes. There are certain processes which arise when detecting the particle. For example, the Higgs boson, it can decay into two photons, two Z bosons, two W bosons, or two leptons. So there, it's a very rich um, uh, a signature and, and you need to know the details in order to be able to judge whether in a given experiment really the Higgs boson was detected or something else. And um, quite fortunately for anions one doesn't need huge accelerators. It can be done as a tabletop experiment in a lab. And um, uh, so, so that's uh, data and micrographs taken from a recent experiment um, of, of Bob Willett. In Alcatel, and um, not so surprisingly, it's about interference experiments. Right? Interference, quantum mechanical interference, is about closed paths. And you can imagine that if you uh, do an interference experiment with an anion, uh, let it go around the loop, then it matters whether a second anion is inside the loop or whether there is no anion, because I just computed the extra quantum mechanical phase which is picked up when these particles go around each other. So that's a micrograph, a top view, so uh, in the plane there is a two-dimensional electrograph as I described, and then uh, metals on top are negatively charged to drive away the electrons underneath, and in this way um, to pattern the system, so underneath, so in the bright area there are no electrons, and uh, in this way something like a quantum dot um, is formed. And so, so that's the detector. And the signature is um, how the resistance of this device changes uh, when uh, the magnetic field is changed or when the voltage of some of these gates is changed. And in the next few slides, I'm going to explain you how these quantum wall interferometers work and, and what to expect. And I will work towards uh, finding the signatures of anions in such experiments. Um, so let, let me briefly um, elaborate on, on this idea of having an extra phase. Uh, so let's just assume that uh, these, these anions would be able uh, to, to follow uh, these black lines and that there are two different possibilities to go from one line to the other and that, that's, that this here is interference loop. And when changing the area of the interference loop by a side gate voltage, then uh, the conductance of the device changes. And when adding a quasi-particle, then there's this extra phase of 2 pi over 3, and the interference pattern um, should be changed. So that's the, the general idea of, of detecting uh, these anions. And um, so how could this be realized of removing or adding anions? So the idea is that if uh, one tunes uh, this voltage in the right way, there might be an energetic degeneracy between having an anion outside the system or having an anion inside the system. And so, as a function of time and randomly, it may hop from the outside to the inside. So in the beginning it stays outside, then it hops inside, stays inside for a while, hops outside, 
uh, stays outside, moves inside, stays inside, and so on. And um, something like this has indeed been observed experimentally by the group of uh, Wu and Kang in Chicago. So the, the um, red, noisy thing is the experimental data, and there are two guides to the eye. <coughs> so they describe an oscillatory behavior due to changing um, a side gate voltage and uh, the magnetic flux. And in the second curve, there is this extra phase added 2 pi over 3 for having uh, one engine going around another engine. And so the interpretation here is that, um, so that, that's a change of the voltage. For some values of the voltage, the number of engines inside is fixed. And then one reaches this energetic degeneracy where engines uh, hop in and out as a function of time and then follow um, the blue curve, which has this extra phase. So you may realize that uh, these data are quite noisy, and also that uh, this paper exists as a preprint and hasn't been published. And uh, if it's such an exciting thing to have onions, then why hasn't the paper been published? And um, um, I'm going to argue that uh, what is not taken into account here, and which is quite important, is the Coulomb interaction between these onions. Right? They are charged. And it's an insulator, so there's no screening. The Coulomb interaction is long range. And so one can imagine uh, that it's important. And um, so that's the outline uh, of my talk. I just gave you an introduction to anionic statistics. Um, and uh, uh, next I will uh, discuss um, uh, idealized quantum ball interferometers, um, how they work and then explain that uh, these idealized models don't quite describe um, experiments, uh, make these models more realistic. And uh, in the last third of my talk, I will uh, discuss the types of engines uh, people really want to detect these days. They are called Majorana engines, and they are potentially useful for something called topological quantum computing. And um, there's a recent experiment uh, by Willett uh, which I flashed at transparency, who claims to have detected them. And I'm going to discuss in some detail whether uh, he really went through all the signatures carefully, which should have been detected, uh, and will argue that actually he wasn't as careful as he should have been. Um, OK, so how do quantum Hall interferometers work? So the basic idea is that particles go in a loop. So that's not a quantum Hall interferometer, but it is an electron interferometer where a thin gold film is on top of some substrate. Um, there is a source for electrons, there is a drain for electrons, there is a magnetic field inside the loop, and the particles have two po the electrons have two possibilities uh, to go around the loop. And that's the result of the experiment. Um, the uh, resistance of the device is a function of magnetic field, and the observation is that uh, there is an oscillatory behavior in the resistance. And if one looks at uh, the amount of magnetic field, which is needed to go from one, say, minimum to the next minimum, and multiplies by the area of the interferometer, one sees that um, the amount of flux change is exactly this h over e, uh, which is called flux quantum, which I mentioned uh, already earlier. So why uh, is, is this result observed? What's the theory for these interferometers? So quantum mechanically, we have an, an amplitude for the electron taking the upper arm uh, or the left arm and another amplitude for taking the right arm. And if you want to know the probability of the electron arriving here, we have to take the sum of the amplitude and then the absolute value squared um, of the wave function. And when doing this, um, there is the absolute value of this exponential, which is 1, exp uh, absolute value of this exponential, which is 1, so that gives us a 2. And then there is the mixed term, which gives us a cosine of the difference um, of these phases for going around along left um, and right path. And um, so it's essentially uh, the same calculation which I did uh, for the engines. This phase difference is an integral um, of the wave vector along paths that can be expressed via the Broglie as the sum of um, um, kinematic contribution and the electromagnetic contribution. This time, the kinematic contribution will not be zero, but I want to assume if, if the ring um, is, is very thin, that it's pretty independent of magnetic field. So it will contribute 
a, a constant phase and then there's the electromagnetic phase. Uh, the electromagnetic, total electromagnetic phase is the difference between the phase for the left path and the right path and that's again an integral along the closed loop of the vector potential. I use uh, Stokes theorem and um, this time uh, I have put an electron charge here and I find that the phase difference is 2 pi whenever the magnetic flux through the ring is changed by this flux quantum h over e. So that's uh, perhaps the simplest way to see why this flux quantum or why this combination of constants h over e has some physical significance. So, it goes, well, so when, a, when an electron goes around a flux um, which has the value of this flux quantum it's the smallest flux such that the total phase is 2 pi. <coughs> now I want to come to uh, quantum hall. I would like to start using classical arguments first. So I'm still thinking about electrons which move in a, a two-dimensional plane. So the classical motion is just a circular motion. Uh, it will go around circles and they will not contribute to transport. If they uh, just go around circles. However, if the system has a boundary or an edge, a different type of path is possible. So it can be a half circle, then it gets reflected from the boundary, makes another half circle, gets reflected again, and these orbits are called skipping orbits. And the big difference between these orbits in the bulk and these uh, skipping orbits is that uh, the skipping orbits correspond to a directed motion of the electron. So it moves along the edge, and it's a one-way street. Due to uh, the fixed chirality in a magnetic field, the electrons can move only in one direction along the edge. So uh, the frequency of the circular motion is the cyclotron frequency, uh, electron charge magnetic field divided by mass. And when doing uh, quantum mechanics of these electrons in a magnetic field, one uses bohr sommerfeld quantization and demands that uh, the phase collected when going around <coughs> one circle, it's an integer multiple, um, or that, that the action uh, uh, when going around this circle is an integer multiple of the Planck constant. And then one finds that the energy spectrum of the system is equivalent to that of a harmonic oscillator. So the, the energy unit is h bar times um, the cyclotron frequency. And uh, there's a ground state energy, one half. And then uh, the higher levels are obtained by adding integers to that. And so uh, this here is the energy spectrum. Uh, these energy values um, or energy levels are called Landau levels. And um, so in two dimensions, uh, we know that a quantum mechanical state is described by two quantum numbers, one for each spatial dimension. But the energy spectrum has only one quantum number. And this implies that um, the second quantum number does not enter uh, the energy, but it will be there all the same. And this implies again that um, uh, these energy levels are highly degenerate, that there are many states available um, at the same energy. And it turns out, if one wants to know the degeneracy, one computes the total flux uh, through the system and divides by the number of flux quanta h over e, and that's the number of electrons uh, which fit into these levels. So I, I had introduced this number nu, which was related to the quantization of the Hall resistivity. And this number nu is uh, the number of uh, fully occupied Landau levels. So if there is one Landau level occupied, it's nu equal 1, 2, and so on. So this explains um, the quantized um, values of the Hall resistivity. And I also argued that in the quantum Hall state, uh, there's an energy gap in the bulk, there is no dissipation in the bulk, and that's the energy gap uh, between these Landau levels here. Uh, the fractional quantum Hall effect comes about, say, when one third of the available states in the lowest Landau level are filled. Um, um, its nature is determined by uh, the Coulomb interaction between electrons, and one can imagine that the Coulomb interaction is particularly important because it is the only thing which can break this degeneracy. So it tries to arrange the electrons in such a way that they minimize their mutual uh, repulsion. So what I want, would like to ask you to remember is that there are energy gaps in the bulk, but there is one-way motion possible along the edge, 
And that's what makes quantum Hall systems actually ideal candidates for interferometers because in a very natural way, one has one-dimensional wires in quantum Hall systems along the edge of the system. So that's a sketch of what one can do with it. So um, inside here is a um, quantum Hall state in the bulk. Uh, here the example is an integer state, so it would be filling fraction 2. And each lambda level, it turns out, comes with its own edge state. So if the filling fraction is 2, there are two edge states. Uh, they are one-way streets, and the only way in which um, resistance or backscattering can arise if um, a right-moving edge and a left-moving edge and opposite sides of the sample are brought in spatial proximity. So that can be achieved by putting negatively charged gates on top of the uh, interferometer. And this here is called a quantum point contact, so this distance would be a few hundred nanometers between these edges and then electrons can tunnel or backscatter from one edge to the other. So the situation is we have two partial waves again. One is backscattered at uh, the first quantum point contact, and the second one is backscattered at the second quantum point contact, and there will be a phase difference e to the i phi between these two partial waves, and we need to sum the amplitudes and take the absolute value squared to get the backscattering probability, and that again is related to the voltage difference measured by these voltage contacts. So current is driven, injected, and extracted from the sample uh, via current contacts, as I discussed in my um, earlier slide. So what is the expectation of what should happen? So there is this um, sum of amplitudes and modulus squared. There will be the real part, which depends on this phase in an oscillatory fashion. And the expectation is that the phase would depend on the strength of magnetic field, on the size of the loop, and possibly on some gate voltage. And for non-interacting electrons, if there's only one edge state, uh, the expectation would be that um, the phase is again uh, determined by the flux, so that the product of uh, change in area, so flux can be Flux can change either by changing area or by changing magnetic field. So if the area is changed, then the amount of change would be the flux quantum divided by the magnetic field, or if the magnetic field is changed, it would be the flux quantum divided by the area, such that in either case, the total flux changes by one flux quantum. So that's the expectation of what should happen. And for the case of a filling fraction one, this is indeed found experimentally. That, uh, so these are oscillations of the conductance uh, while changing uh, the magnetic field um, from uh, the Stony Brook group. And uh, if one takes into account the area of the device, one sees that one oscillation period indeed corresponds to changing uh, the flux by one flux quantum. However, and quite surprisingly, something very different is found at um, higher filling fractions, two and four. So it is found that uh, the magnetic field period is half at filling fraction 2 and one quarter at filling fraction uh, 4. And I think that's quite surprising because the argument I gave you for computing this magnetic field period was quite general. It only relied on electromagnetism and on Stokes' theorem. And uh, this flux quantum only contains uh, fundamental constants. Uh, so this deviation tells us that we haven't understood something profound about these interferometers yet. And this also explains us that we should maybe careful with uh, analyzing fractional interferometers, which are even more complicated than these uh, integer electron interferometers. <clears throat> so I would now like to continue and try to explain how this surprising deviation in, in, in magnetic field period, which is the signature of the interferometer of the particle, uh, can be understood. And I would like to argue that one needs a more realistic or more complete model. So originally I assumed that uh, the filling fraction or the electron density is everywhere constant inside the interferometer. So that's not really realistic. If you think about having um, a system of electrons and putting gates, then underneath the gates the density will be zero. Uh, halfway in between the gates the density will have a maximum. So the plausible thing is that there is a smooth density profile going from zero uh, to this maximum, and so there might be some extra electrons 
uh, in here and there may be some extra electrons in there uh, which would partially occupy the lambda level. And the way it happens, there's usually disorder in the systems due to the dopants which bring the electrons in in the first place. And these extra electrons in here are localized. So they can move only very slowly by hopping from one localized position to another localized position. And I want now to consider not only that electrons can tunnel uh, from one edge to the other edge, but I would also like to consider that electrons can tunnel from this high density region in the bulk where electrons can hop around to a high density region inside the interferometer where electrons can hop around. So this can be happening either along the blue lines, which would be a forward tunneling, along the red lines, which would be a backward tunneling, and in addition, uh, there is this process, this backscattering, which I introduced initially, which I want to call process C for now. Uh, I would like to first discuss uh, the physics of process A and B, since that's simpler than the physics of process C, but I will come back uh, to process C. So, wh what's the idea? So, the idea is that essentially uh, this electron island, this high density region here, is like a quantum dot. There are extra electrons, and it's weakly coupled to the outside world which means the number of electrons is a good quantum number. There's an integer number of electrons um, in there if the conductance, uh, if this coupling is, is very weak. And uh, this number of electrons can only change under very special conditions if there is an energetic degeneracy between having, say, n electrons and n plus 1 electrons in there. So this is a phenomenon known under the name of Coulomb blockade. So I want to assume that this electron island in the center of the interferometer is in the Coulomb blockade regime. And um, um, it turns out that the period of conductance oscillations can be determined from the period of the island energy uh, when changing the magnetic field. And that's what I want to compute now. So the white region is the region of the quantized Hall effect where an integer number of Landau levels is occupied. And I have some reference curve in here. So the thing I know is that the Hall conductivity is quantized region and inside the blue thing is my island of electrons which has some extra density and what I want to argue now is if I change the magnetic field by some amount delta phi uh, the flux going through this reference area A0 will be changed by delta phi times uh, the area A0 and I divide again uh, by the flux quantum because that's a good unit to measure the small fluxes and um, like before, where I had this example of the extremely thin solenoid, when changing the magnetic flux, there will be a current flowing uh, into the inside of the loop, and there will be charge accumulation. And uh, the amount of current um, is again given by the filling fraction, the flux change, and the electron charge, as before. So we went through that uh, by integrating the flux over time. And now I can write down charging energy for this electron island. So charging energy is charge imbalance squared divided by a capacitance. So what is the charge imbalance? So there is the number n of electrons sitting in there and then there is this extra charge um, uh, from, from this induced voltage which is given by this filling fraction times the flux change and then there is some um, uh, ideal charge value determined by the gate voltage which tells us which charge we would like to have here if charge was not quantized. So that's the charge imbalance and the charging energy is the square of the charge imbalance times electron charge squared divided by uh, the capacitance which is also called charging energy. And um, so that's this um, charging energy I just calculated and now I'm asking um, how much do I have to change the flux such that the charging energy returns to the same value as before? So n gate is fixed, and the only thing I can change is n, but n changes in integer steps. So I can change n by 1 and change the flux by minus 1 over uh, the filling fraction. And in this way I find that the magnetic field period is not only the flux quantum divided by the area, but that due to this charging effects, inverse of the filling fraction enters here. And that's exactly what was seen in the experiments I introduced to you, that when the filling fraction is increased, 
the magnetic field period um, increases, and that's due to the Coulomb interaction uh, between the electrons uh, in the center. Okay, so this um, helps to understand um, these experiments. Now, what about um, the backscattering here? So I want to assume now that um, this electron island is so weakly tunnel coupled that it will not contribute to electric transport for which one needs like 10 to the 9 electrons per second um, but that uh, the charging physics which I discussed is still intact and now there will be a Coulomb interaction between the interior of the island and the electrons moving along these one-way um, um, edge states and um, uh, so if one uh, goes through the details, one sees that um, the resistance change is still an oscillatory function, <coughs> so a cosine, that's 2 pi times the flux, that's the contribution we discussed. Uh, there is a contribution due to um, the gate voltage, and then there is a coupling constant, which is here taken as some ratio, which I don't want to explain at the moment, times the charge imbalance uh, on this inner island, which we just calculated. So it's the flux times the filling fraction, the electron number, and then some gate voltage distribution. So the important thing is now as follows. Um, so this here measures the change in magnetic field, and this here, uh, by changing the gate voltage, measures the change in area. So when the gate voltage is positive, extra electrons are attracted, and the area increases. If the gate voltage is negative, um, electrons are expelled and the area decreases. So if I neglect the interaction contribution for the moment, then I see if I want the argument of the cosine to stay constant, if the magnetic field increases, the gate voltage has to decrease. And that is seen in very large interferometers with an area of 18, I mean, very large for these quantum interferometers, uh, uh, tiny by absolute standards, with an area of 18 square micron. If the magnetic field is increased, um, the gate voltage has to be reduced in order to keep the flux constant. So this color code is for uh, the resistance and line with a constant color are lines where the argument of the cosine stays constant. And if there is a coupling now between the outer edge and this interior island, um, the flux enters in a negative way. So it's a phi minus this filling fraction times flux and uh, this is able, this coupling, to revert these lines of constant phase and that's the signature that in a given experiment interactions, Coulomb interaction between the center island uh, and the edge is important. Okay, so now uh, you know quite a bit about quantum all interferometers and about the importance of interactions. And now I would like to go on to explain uh, the types of anions and the experiment to detect them, uh, which people are eager to detect at the moment. Uh, they are called Majorana anions. And um, what is so special about them, if we have uh, these, these uh, quasi particles at fixed positions, there is not only one ground state wave functions, but wave function, but there are several ground state wave functions which have um, uh, pretty much exactly the same energy. And it so happens that if there are n quasi particles, say like four, um, the degeneracy of the ground state is exponential in the number of quasi-particles. Um, so it's 2 to the power of n over 2. So I want to use this example of four quasi-particles, then I have a fourfold degenerate ground state, which means I have four different wave functions, which depend on the coordinates of all electrons, are endosymmetric when exchanging electrons, and depend as parameters on the location of these quasi-particles. Now I want to think again about what happens if I take one particle in a loop around another particle. So if the final position is identical to the initial position, then um, the Hilbert space has to be the same, this fourfold degenerate ground state. And this means that the new wave function has to be a linear combination of these four wave functions. So that's now much richer physics than before. So before I was considering multiplying the wave function with a complex phase factor, now I'm considering the possibility that taking one particle in a loop around another particle would turn, say, a given wave function psi 1 into a linear combination um, of the wave functions. So in a formal way, this can be described by multiplying the vector of wave functions with a matrix. 
Okay, why is this interesting? Now I consider two types of loops, say taking the upper left particle around the upper right, and that would correspond to multiplying the wave function vector by a matrix R, or taking the, or taking the lower left particle around um, the upper left, which would correspond to a matrix W. Now I can combine these operations. First apply W and then apply R, or apply R first and apply W afterwards. And in general you know that matrix multiplication is non-commutative, so it matters in which order uh, matrices are multiplied, or alternatively it matters in which order particles are taken around each other. And uh, since groups which are not commutative are called non-abelian groups, uh, these anions are called non-abelian anions. And Majorana anions are exactly um, of this type. And the interesting thing is now that this, um, uh, this unitary transformation, R or W, only depends on the topology of how particles are taken around each other and not on the details as long as the particles are far apart from each other and as long as they are slowly taken around each other. So it's, um, and, and that is what people call topologically protected. So it doesn't matter if, if, if this line wiggles a bit or if it's a bit wider or if it's a bit smaller. So this unitary transformation is independent of um, the details. And that's why people think that's something cool and interesting because there's a way of manipulating a quantum system which does not depend on details and so it should be robust, say, against thermal fluctuations and would be a good way to implement quantum bits. So, what are the physical systems where or in which these Majorana endians, non-abelian endians, uh, can be observed? So one is the quantum Hall state at filling fraction 5 half, when two Landau levels are completely full and there is a half-filled one. Uh, there are strongly correlated materials with strong spin-orbit coupling, uh, where people believe that such uh, Majorana endians could exist, and there are hybrid materials of S-wave superconductors and topological insulators, uh, where also should exist, but I want to stick with uh, the quantum Hall effect uh, for this talk. So in the next two slides I want to say a few words about this quantum Hall state at filling fraction 5 half and how one can try to understand that uh, the quasi-particles there are special. So first of all this 5 half is decomposed into 2 plus 1 half, so that's the easy part of the explanation. Uh, the two is just two completely filled Landau levels, which are separated by an energy gap from the next Landau level, so they don't do anything, and I consider them as inert. On top of that, I have a half-filled Landau level, and um, it so happens when doing experiments with a half-filled Landau level, um, the, the um, particles behave as if the effective magnetic field was zero, and uh, this behavior is called uh, composite fermions, and the way to think about them is that it's a bound state between one electron and two flux quanta. Right? If the Landau level is full, there is one flux quantum for each electron. If it's half full, there are two flux quanta for each electron. And if one assumes the possibility that there might be a bound state of the electron and the flux quanta, then the magnetic field is gone, because all the magnetic field is absorbed by these new composite particles, which are a combination of electron and flux quanta, such that the magnetic field is zero and they behave like fermions. <clears throat> so it is well known that Fermi liquids can have a superconducting instability and form a paired state. And that's what people believe um, uh, should happen to these composite fermions. Um, but due to the strong magnetic field, their spin is polarized. So in a standard superconductor, um, electrons are in a singlet state, which means the spin wave function is um, odd under particle exchange such that the spatial wave function can be symmetric and can be an S-wave state. Um, here the spins are polarized, but due to the Pauli principle, the bound state wave function has to be anti-symmetric, so um, the orbital character of the paired state has to be a P-wave uh, superconductor, so it's an exotic uh, superconductor. So the claim is that there could be uh, such an exotic superconductor of these composite fermions, now let's try to think about what the quasi-particles are. So I argued that you can obtain the quasi-particle charge by inserting a flux quantum. Now superconductors are special. You know that in superconductors, flux is quantized in units of H over 2E. 
So we can insert or should insert half a flux quantum. And um, since uh, we have this fixed ratio of charge and flux, so we have two flux quanta for one electron. If we insert half a flux quantum, that would be one quarter of an electron. So the quasi-particles here I expect to have one quarter of the electron charge. Uh, this quarter charge has been measured experimentally in scan gate experiments, in shot noise experiments, so that's pretty well established that these particles with one quarter of the electron charge are around in this quantum hall state. But there is more to these particles than the charge. It turns out that if one has two of these vortices, <coughs> um, they are low energy electronic bound states such that the system of, of um, 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 two vortices, two superconducting vortices, two quasi-particles harbors one electronic or one fermionic degree of freedom. And since um, charge is not a good quantum number in a superconductor, it's a condensate of different numbers of Cooper pairs, um, this is called neutral fermion. So it has the, the, the fermionic properties, Pauli principle, so there can only be one of it or zero, but it doesn't have charge. So the idea is that two of these quasi-particles um, have this degeneracy and the quantum number is labeled neutral fermion, whether it's there or whether it's absent. And um, so this explains the degeneracy I mentioned before, that um, two of them together harbor this um, um, quantum mechanical degree of freedom. And it turns out that no local measurement can determine whether there is zero or one neutral fermion, and this implies that uh, local operators cannot lead to decoherence of these uh, quantum bits. And how does one change the occupancy? So the occupancy is changed by taking a third particle, moving it through the connecting line between the two particles, and that changes the occupancy. And that goes together with this idea that taking particles in, loop around, in loops around each other or braiding changes the quantum mechanical ground state um, of the system. And all this together establishes well, is the de definition of these particles being non-abelian anions. Now the question is how to detect this non-abelian property of these anions. In the next few slides, I would like to explain that uh, there is a signature aspect expected in interference experiments. So I again consider two quantum point contacts where partial waves can be uh, backscattered at the first or can backscatter at the second. And I want to consider the two integer edges as inert and only keep um, the, the edge state of this exotic half-filled uh, Landau level. Uh, now this edge state has a somewhat richer structure than the skipping orbits I uh, described before. Uh, the way you can think about it is that in a superconducting vortex, the order parameter goes to zero. And whenever this order parameter goes to zero, um, these uh, special fermionic states arise. At the boundary of the sample, the order parameter goes to zero as well, and that's why these special fermions can travel along the boundary um, of, the, of the sample as well, but I don't want to distinguish this here visually. Um, so what is the idea? So when changing the area of the device by using a, a side gate, then the expectation is that the conductance of the device will oscillate. And now the claim is whenever there is one of these quasi-particles or an odd number of these quasi-particles, the oscillations are gone. How can one understand uh, that this is true? So for the purpose of explaining the signature, I mentally combine two of them, one inside and one outside, and since there's an odd number inside, there will always be one left, which I can combine with another quasi-particle outside, and that's now a two-state quantum system. And now I consider an interference process. So there is a left partial wave reflected at the first QPC, and I want to assume that my two-state system is in the state zero. And now I explained whenever uh, one of these quasi-particles goes through the connecting line, it will change the occupancy of the state. So the right partial wave will change the occupancy of the state. And so this two-state system will act as a position measurement. We, we can determine whether an interfering quasi-particle uh, was uh, tunneling here or whether it was tunneling there. And since the position is measured according to the Bohr complementarity principle, um, interference is gone. And um, that's this independence of side gate voltage. So when there is an even number of quasi-particles inside, 
I can mutually combine them and I can characterize their state by the number of neutral fermions. And it turns out that uh, the phase, so the interference is back, and that the phase of the interference pattern depends on the parity of these neutral fermions. So if there is an even number of neutral fermions, there is one interference pattern, and if there is an odd number of uh, neutral fermions, um, there is an interference pattern phase shifted by pi. So that's um, the, the basic theory which I would like to uh, denote as orthodox theory of this um, uh, five-half non-abelian quantum Hall state. So that's the summary. If there's an odd number of quasi-particles, no interference. If there's an even number of quasi-particles, there is interference, but depending on the number of neutral fermions describing um, this uh, ground state degeneracy, there may or may not be a phase shift of pi. Okay. Um, now, back to the experiment. So I briefly mentioned this experiment by Bob Willett. So he built um, a tiny, tiny interferometer with an area about, a uh, lithographic area of about two square microns. And he measured uh, the periodicity with magnetic field. And he found a result very different from the integer uh, interferometers, uh, a, a period of one-fifth flux quantum. But it's not very different, so I argue that at filling fraction 4 there can be a period of one fourth of a flux quantum, but we found this specific result. Uh, and he interpreted it in the following way. So one can write down a formula for the resistance which has a p factor 1 plus minus 1 to the power of uh, the number of quasi particles. So if n quasi particle is odd, minus 1 to the power of some odd number is minus 1 then the p-factor is zero, whereas if n quasi particle is even, minus one to some even power is plus one, and then the p-factor is two. And that's exactly the even-odd effect I just explained. If there's an odd number of quasi particles, no interference. If there's an even number of quasi particles, uh, there is interference. And then there's the oscillatory contribution, so it's the magnetic flux, and it's multiplied by uh, the fractional quasi particle charge, then there is an abelian statistical phase, which in this case turns out to be pi over 4. And then there is this pi phase change, which goes with uh, the parity of the neutral fermions, which are inside uh, the interferometer. So that's just a formula describing uh, what I explained in the previous slides. Now, Willard argued that um, since the filling fraction is 5 half, and I explained that the charge when adding a flux quantum is given by the filling fraction, so there should be a charge of 5 half added when one flux quantum is added. Quasi particles have a charge of E over 4, and that means 10 quasi particles are added to the system when one flux quantum is added. So 10 quasi particles means uh, 5 even quasi particle numbers and 5 odd quasi particle numbers. So this factor here uh, will have 5 oscillation periods. And that's how Willett interpreted um, his data. So he measured uh, the, the area of the device by looking at um, oscillations in the integer regime and then found that um, in the fractional regime, oscillations are five times as frequent. So he did Fourier transforms, compared uh, the frequencies corresponding to the peaks, and they very roughly differ by a factor of five. So what's the problem with this interpretation? The problem is that the cosine is not only multiplied by this oscillatory factor, but it's also multiplied by the 1. And the fundamental frequency which should be observed is when computing the Fourier transform of the 1 multiplying the cosine. And um, then it turns out that the fundamental frequency should be 1 flux quantum. Uh, and, and the state also appears as a variant, so, so the state, this, this P-wave superconductor of composite fermions is also called Pfaffian state, and there is a particle whole conjugate variant which is called ender Pfaffian. Um, so what I did here is I plotted this formula as is, and one sees that there are indeed these high frequency oscillations, but there is also a low frequency oscillation due to the one multiplying the cosine, and this should be observed experimentally when uh, taking a Fourier transform of the spectrum. But it was not observed experimentally, and I think that's an indication that the interpretation is actually incorrect, uh, which was given to the data. 
So how can one reconcile the experimental observation of this uh, one-fifth of a flux quantum period with the fact that um, this orthodox theory actually predicts a 1 or 1.5 flux quantum uh, period? Um, so one possibility is that there can be an exchange of neutral fermions between these fuzzy particles localized on the bulk and um, this um, uh, neutral fermion highway along the edge. So the idea is that um, these neutral fermions can tunnel to the edge and then move away and a new neutral fermion might come along the edge and get localized there and every time this happens the interference pattern changes by pi. And that's a very bad thing. If randomly in time an interference pattern changes by pi, it just means that it cancels each other and that there is no interference observable in the end. So um, this can destroy the interference and um, there are also more standard fuzzy particles corresponding to inserting one flux quantum. They are standard abelian anions. They still could go around the loop and give interference. So the question is, will this really happen? Um, this change in the neutral fermion number and it will happen uh, if there is no energy splitting between these two states. So um, it turns out, so I told you there is no energy splitting. That's true when they are very far apart from each other, but when they get close on a scale of less than 100 micron, an energy splitting develops and when running the numbers one finds uh, that it's very unlikely that the energy splitting is larger than temperature. So um, there is a second aspect, which is that um, this, this Coulomb coupling between bulk and edge, which I discussed, is enhanced um, for fraction of quantum all states when this filling fraction difference is very small. So in the integer case, delta nu is 1. And in the fractional case, <coughs> it turns out delta nu is 1, 6, such that for the 5 half state, Coulomb interaction should be six times as important as for integer states. And when taking all of this together, that it's this, uh, assuming that it's the particle whole conjugate state, that um, the E over 4 interference is killed by this flipping of qubits, and that um, due to this enhancement, uh, this 5 half interferometer is in the Coulomb dominated regime where interactions are important, then one finds a flux period of 1 seventh of a flux quantum, which we believe is within error bars um, of the experiment. So there are a few objections which um, the experts might have, which I don't want to um, discuss here. I just want to leave you with um, the conclusion that when applying this orthodox theory for understanding 5 half interferometers, there's actually a discrepancy with the experimental observation, and that this discrepancy can be um, lifted if one assumes the possibility that uh, these qubits flip rapidly such that the interference of the Majorana anions is destroyed and if the system is Coulomb dominated. And in order to check whether it's really Coulomb dominated, one would need these two-dimensional sweeps of both gate voltage and magnetic field. So thank you for your attention. Good time for a few questions. with a somehow question of principle mm -hmm. or conceptual question about anions. Mm -hmm. uh, the anions are confined to a two-dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. But that is produced by a narrow potential well. Mm -hmm. And if you put enough energy into the anions, they'll get into excited states of that well, and that means you now have three-dimensional motion. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. means the statistics have to change. Right. So, so I, mm -hmm. are we getting here something that's analogous to uh, symmetry breaking, where at high energies we have a symmetry or the correct yeah. statistics, and to lo at lower energies uh, these statistics break down and get replaced mm -hmm. by? In, in some way, I think that's what happens. So, I always emphasize that I need to adiabatically move particles around each other. So adiabatically means that the um, h bar times the characteristic frequency of, of the motion has to be less than the energy gap in the ground state. And if I move them too fast, then I can excite these higher um, uh, harmonics in that motion, and then uh, the phase will not be universal anymore. And in that sense, this anionic statistics will break down 
if I move them too fast, such that their motion can effectively become three-dimensional. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. What is the confinement width of that narrow uh, mm -hmm. potential well? So it's 10 to 20 nanometers, the width of the wave function in that direction. Uh, are they they're searching for these um, abelian um, anions yes. with graphene now, right? In the uh, like the two-dimensional two-dimensional uh, two materials. Yes. Um, I was wondering. I don't know much uh, about braid theory, mm -hmm. um, but does the possibility of having multiple braiding occurring like affect the, the calculations at all? I mean, at some stage, if you say play twice yeah. with Majorana engines, you will come back to where you started. But I argued if, if you, you, you will change the occupancy from 0 to 1, and if you braid again, it will go down from Close 1 to 0. So, in that sense, um, multiple braiding will have an effect. All right. Yeah. So, it just knocks it back down. Yeah. So, the Majorana here is the neutral fermion. I mean, the, the, the Majorana is the neutral fermion. That's the no, the Majoranas are the quasi-particles, and if you combine two Majoranas, you get a, a standard fermion. <coughs> so where does the, the them being their own antiparticle come in here when they're non-abelian? I guess that's what I don't quite understand. Okay, I didn't discuss it at all. <laughs> so the, the idea is the following. That, um, so let's assume you, you have two of these localized particles and denote them by operators gamma 1 and gamma 2. And uh, for these operators, uh, you demand that they are their own antiparticles so that uh, emission conjugation doesn't change anything. So gamma 2 equal to gamma 2 uh, dagger. And then you can form new operators or a new operator C, which would be gamma 1 plus I gamma 2. And C dagger would be gamma 1 minus i gamma 2. And if in addition you demand anti-commutation properties gamma i, gamma j, anti-commutator equal um, delta ij, you will find that c and c dagger have the standard Dirac anti-commutation properties. And in that sense, you can formally build one, so that, so c, c dagger c, that's the occupation number of neutral fermions, and you can build this from uh, the Majorana operators. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? All right, if not, let's thank Professor Rosenau again.